So I took out the fish gun. I loaded it. Do not touch my children again. Ever. You know, I would have shot. You would have shot yeah. them? Yeah. Yeah. Mommy, I'm bad. Yeah. Yeah. No, leave me now. Would if she me, could would have see it me in the shower, she would have it in the shower. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, it was like, hey, <laughs> And then I walked in. And you should have seen the faces when they see me come in. It's like, what? She is here. We didn't hear her coming. <laughs> It's your girl Mel and we are here with mommy so you know it's another story time <laughs> it's story time part 13 mm. we're going up in numbers mm -hmm. so yes as usual you know I'm just going to sit by on the side because I wasn't born yet so I don't know what's happening <laughs> so I'm just going to listen to what mommy has to tell us okay so mommy the floor is yours. Thank you. Disclaimer. The stories that I'm going to tell in this series are my experience, my truth, and my point of view over the past 38 years that I have been in Jamaica. And it's in no way intended to slander any person, the culture of Jamaica, or the island as a whole. Hi, Mel's lovelies again. Um, I realized after the last story time that, as usual, I forgot like one or two stories that uh, belong into the last time bracket. So uh, I'm just going to tell them now. <coughs> First story is one night, uh, everybody was in the bed asleep already, and when I heard somebody kind of start to make noise at the front door like they were trying to pry it open what you were where were you in Norwich oh. yeah. I thought that was before marina times that's why I said I have to tell it now because it's yeah yeah within just this time bracket for the so we were in Norwich and and then like I said I heard somebody like prying at the front door and I was like what is this so at the time, a uh, Buka or shepherd lady was always sleeping in the house. Actually, she was always sleeping beside my bed. So I called her, I said, come Buka. And we had a fish gun as well. So I took out the fish gun, I loaded it. And then I went in the living room, right? Like I was standing here, the front door was over there. Had Buka by my side, fish gun pointed to the door, and then I said to the, and it was still like, it's like somebody had tried to pry open the door, and I said, Oh, it's up, whoever is out there. I'm standing here with my loaded fish gun, and may have my shepherd lady beside me, so open the door now. You're gonna see me go shoot ya! <laughs> and then for a moment we didn't hear anything. And then I was like, uh, of course I was nervous. I was like, what the hell am I going to do if this guy's really come in? And then suddenly I heard like somebody turning around and then you heard the footsteps going up the steps to the road. And I said, oh, I'm gone. <laughs> yes! Mommy, I'm a bad girl. <coughs> so do you feel like if the person did come through the door... I would have shot. You would have shot yeah. them? Yeah. Yeah. Mommy, I'm a bad girl. Yeah. Leave me now. Leave me now. Leave me now. Bad girl. Literally, so I would, don't know where I would get him. You know, I mean, or if it would kill him or not. But at that point in time, I don't care. Because I have my children sleeping in, in their room. And and no, so, so where was the, where was Lou? I have no idea where he was at that time. We were we were alone in the house at that time. Mm. Because of course, with a man, then it would have been different, you mm -hmm. know. But I mean, for me alone with my my picnic, so I had to take action. 
So anyhow, it did work. So I was proud of myself. I said, yes. <laughs> We'll get rid of him. <laughs> that was story number one. And now the second one I remember is at the time um, my sons were going to prep school. And that prep school was supposed to be the best in town. Which it, had, it really had a good reputation and stuff. And, and so of course I had to put my children in there. When one day, my oldest son, Yosha, came home crying. At the time, he was about 10 years old or something, 9 or 10. <coughs> 9. He was, he was pretty small still. Came home crying, completely distraught. And I said, what's, what's happening? What, what is going on with you? What's your problem? And he cried, teacher, they like me. But I didn't do what she said that I did and she didn't want to listen to me and I couldn't say nothing and she licked me and that is not fair. He was really, I mean, he was really distraught, you know, and I know Yosha, Yosha is hard in taking as a child, you know, I mean, you could do a lot of things with him and you would never cry. So for him to be so upset, it must have been something really bad. So once he cooled down, I let him explain the situation. I don't exactly know anymore what was going on, but the, the, the point for him was that the teacher accused him wrongfully. Mm -hmm. He tried to explain mm -hmm. and the teacher wouldn't listen. Mm -hmm. So he, that was the main subject for him. So next day, me, mommy, you know, you do something to my child. Walk straight to the school. Oh. I went straight to the teacher and I asked her, and, and mind you, at that point in time, we are talking now, what was it, 1989, about that. Uh, it wasn't uncommon in Jamaican schools for teachers to beat the children. They would take a ruler and say, stretch out your hand and poof, you know, or, or some other stuff. That, that was normal. But me now, as, as a German and being completely against punishment, corporal punishment, for me it was like, well, if they want to do it to their children, fine. I'm, I think it happens sometimes even today. I'm not sure. But do not touch my child, right? So I went there and I confronted the teacher. One older lady, I mean, she was in her 50s at the time. And I asked her if she did uh, uh, beat my son. And she said yes. And I said, well, but there has been a problem. My son claims that what you uh, punish him for, he didn't do. And that you wouldn't listen when he tried to tell you his side of the story. And then she started, me, I, I, I've been teacher since 24 years and I know what I'm doing and you can't tell me nothing. And I said, relax, I'm not saying you are a bad teacher, but what I'm talking about is that you did not give my son the chance to rectify the story and tell his side of the story. <laughs> Again, I, I, I'm a teacher since so long, I know. And I was, I, I was getting impatient now, you know. <laughs> I said, look here, we are talking about two different topics here right now. And I said, just to make myself clear, in the future, do not touch my children again, ever. And then she was like, okay, you know, and I was, and, and I was really mad at that time. And I went home after that, I just said goodbye. And I said, I hope we are clear on this now. And I went home and then considering, I said, well, my children and I will have no nice time in a school again with that teacher. I, I doubt it. So I decided to change the school. Found another school. Actually, it was a Baptist school. And for, belonging to the Baptist uh, church. And so I, I enrolled both of them there because, as I said, it, for me, it didn't make sense to keep them in that school. And... Uh, so they, they went to school there, everything was fine for a while. When at that point in time we were in the marina already, but as it belongs to this story, my son came home one day again. 
not crying this time. And he said, Mommy, teacher beat me. And I said, Oh my God. Now it started all like, over again. All over again. <laughs> then they looked at me and said, But I deserved it. <laughs> I said, Okay, if I saw, lucky me, I don't have to go. <laughs> so that was a happy end to that story. And he basically finished his prep school time there and then went on to teach field. <laughs> Okay, that was that story. <clears throat> um, next, I would like to introduce somebody into the story time that has, how would I say that, that, that has played a pretty important role over the coming years. Um, it's uh, a lady with her two children and the two children became like siblings to mine that's why i would like to introduce him so the lady's name is rita and we met at the reef beach in port antonio because i went there one afternoon with my children and saw this white lady with two mixed children and the children were in the water they started right away to go in with mayumi and start playing around and of course as it is as mothers we start to talk with each other and she was like oh he, uh, german she came from germany as well <clears throat> so we started to talk and then afterwards she said oh sabina do you have german books i i need something to read i'm getting crazy I'm, all my books are finished so i don't have nothing anymore and of course i mean me being an avid reader i mean i i, I was reading like uh, every time of the day while I was cooking, my book was lying beside me. Of course, going to the bathroom, uh, anywhere you you would if see me, you would see me with a book. She would have it in the shower. I, uh, yeah, <laughs> seriously. I mean, it was like hey, <laughs> so. Of course, I had books in German, and uh, I had them at home. So I invited her and said, "Well, why don't you pass at my house, and then you can choose some books and read them." And then, while while we were standing there, we we get to exchange our stories how come and how we end up or whatever and and uh, she came from munich was not living in jamaica but visiting frequently because the father of her two children uh, came from port antonio and uh, as life went uh, she had inherited quite a big sum sum of money so for her it was no problem to fly back and forth and Mm -hmm. live in a good hotel and have fun with her children but she was very very down to earth and 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 uh, very friendly and then uh, i just told her a bit about my story how i ended up in jamaica blah blah <clears throat> and then she started to tell me about her baby father her ex-husband which she was at the time ex because uh, of course as many many jamaicans i'm sorry to say once they reach abroad especially if they get married to a woman they start to i don't know if they don't take life serious anymore or if they can't adapt to uh, the lifestyle but the experience we have made over the years is that many guys just start to treat their wives awfully horribly and getting really demanding as well because him of course knowing that she had money wanted always this and that and the other hmm so she couldn't take it any longer and she got divorced and but she said well but i'm still coming to jamaica because it's my children's father country and i want them to know jamaica as well so her two children were their older uh, child was a girl her name was sandy and uh, just one year after she had her son his name uh, was Don and like I was saying the two of them and Mayumi started to play and they went along well so the whole time while uh, Rita was in Jamaica we would meet frequently and the children would play together and we, we started up some kind of a friendship there um, thus have introduced Rita I, I leave her aside for the time being because uh, her other uh, uh, roles in this history will come later 
but it is you know about so her, just right? keep in mind that there was <coughs> rita and her two kids right and and whenever she came to jamaica she would of course come visit so now life in our new life in the marina was uh, starting which was kind of interesting i had never ever run a business before in my life so now you have to imagine that marina that i purchased there now had 14 employees we had chefs well you didn't run a big business like that because you had your pizzeria yeah right? but that was practically yeah. me you know or yeah, maybe one just... one other person but that was nothing compared to having suddenly 14 That's employees <laughs> full security a secretary a handyman then and the, the bar and the kitchen uh, staff and it was like it kind of over overwhelmed me a bit because of course i had no idea luckily the whole place was stocked with liquor with beer with this the whole kitchen was still full when i took over and and everybody they knew what they were doing so basically i took over all the employees of course mm -hmm. you know because for me it was like yeah man you guys know what you are doing Just i have to learn doing it. <laughs> exactly go on doing it <laughs> and uh, of course, after uh, giving up my house in Norwich, I didn't have any place to stay, but the former owner uh, had a 50-foot uh, motor sailor uh, docked at the marina, which a motor sailor was not in any state to sail anymore. So he would leave it there, basically. And uh, that boat was called Huntress. And therefore, he did call the, the entire place Huntress Marina. And he offered me that I could move on the Huntress until I found something else. I wanted to move somewhere else. Because, I mean, 50 foot boat is pretty big. You have your go down, you have your galley, you have your little living area. And then you have the captain's quarters. And in the bow, you have, we had two more cabins. Uh, both of them with, with double and triple bed. So I came back and with my packs and bags and, and my t three children and we entered that boat. And who do I meet on the boat? Because apparently Vern had, had allowed him to, to take the uh, captain's quarters for the time being. And I was like, Weird, you give away half of the board? Okay, fine. Because the person that I met there was the captain of the boat that I went to Florida with. If you remember the famous drug boat. Drug boat. <laughs> so actually we were good friends. And I did not have a problem, especially if it was supposed to be temporary. So he had the, the captain quarters with his uh, uh, baby mother and his little daughter. And we had the uh, two bow. Uh, cabins and and started our little life there you know everybody used the galley we used to sometimes cook together sometimes don't and and I was trying to get used to run a business which uh, I, I sat in the office with my secretary quite often to find out what was going on and then I had to look in the kitchen and find out how they were doing what because we had of course already made menu already as well um, like I said I was so glad that all of them didn't know what to do and they were kind of friendly but the interesting thing was at, at, I always wear foot chains since I was 50, 16 years old I still have them now I, nowadays I still wear them and at that point in time, I had one of these Indian silver chains that had little bells on it, on mm -hmm. the bottom. So it would always go cling, 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 cling when I was walking. So basically, they got to and I said, oh, we can hear when Sabina is coming every time. You know, so, uh, of course, you know, when you work somewhere and you know the bus is not directly around, you will behave different than if the bus is coming. And I could never surprise them because they would hear me way before I even reached them. And so I kind of 
realized that they were always behaving very nice and friendly and this and that and I said I wonder if it's because they always know when I'm coming so one day I took off the chain and then I walked in and you should have seen the faces when they see me come in it's like what she is here we didn't hear her coming <laughs> not that it was such a big difference so it was kind of okay for them still and for me too so I put on back my chain after <laughs> Because I saw that uh, it wouldn't make such a big difference after all. But they kind of saw that I was uh, inexperienced and stuff. So, so they tried, of course, their little things, you know. And, and for example, what they started to do, which they never did before apparently, they started to come too late to work. Because we were, the place was open from 7 in the morning to at least 10 in the night. That me meant we had two shifts, both waitress and chef. One started at seven to three and then from three to 10. So, the, especially the afternoon shift really started to come always too late. And it was one lady especially came too late all the time. And then she always uh, asked her every time, I said, why are you coming too late? Oh, <clears throat> it was raining. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, I was at the hairdressers and I didn't finish in time. Also, every time she have another excuse. And I told her, one day I told her, look, I'm warning you. This is your first warning. And I'm telling you from now, you will get a second one, but with a third one, you're out. And they were like, yeah, yeah, let her talk. You know, she's not serious. She needs us. Blah, 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 blah. So the second time come when she came too late and I said, okay, remember what I told you? This is your second warning. And again, yeah, yeah, let her talk, you know, because I, otherwise I was friendly and polite with them. And you see, it's, it's a huge difference between how I or we treated people or what you would normally find in, in, uh, as an employer in Jamaica because here the employers, they are not very nice with their people. A lot of times, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of times, once you have employees, the employers are treating them really harsh. And I refused to do that because I, I came from Europe and I said, I will treat you like human beings, like good people that you are but that caused the problem that they wouldn't take me serious because they were so used to be really shouted at and i mean people here they will they will even curse you out over nothing you know and then why are you behaving like that mind me fire you blah, 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 the whole time <clears throat> i never used to do that so the third time came and that lady came too late and i said all right here we are. You can just turn around and leave. You are fired. And everybody that was there, it was shift change, you know, so <coughs> quite a few people there. <coughs> everybody got big eyes like that. It's like, whoa, she's serious. And that is how I practically gain respect in the beginning because as I was saying they were not taking me serious at all and that person had to leave I mean she was paid off and everything correctly but sorry you messed it up <coughs> and then we had a handyman Sheppy he was so cute he was an older Indian man uh, very hard working, very hard working, but I had to tell him every day again what to do. <laughs> I mean, every day he had the same things to do. In the morning, come in, sweep out the place, uh, arrange the tables and chairs properly, uh, then come and I would give him a list and he would do some shopping and stuff. And whatever else was necessary throughout the day, he would do. But especially the sweeping part and stuff i mean all of that was understood basically but often enough it's like he, he came in and said oh what do you want me to do i said should be sweep <laughs> <laughs> set up the table 
do this, do that, do the other that you are supposed to do every day. But it came like every day it came and practically it asked what to do, you know. So that was kind of interesting in the beginning as well. Maybe that was his way to try yeah. and get another task. A so, different one. Yeah, but well, he would get a few little other. But you see the problem is too when you can't really read or write. You know, then then it's getting harder to give you some other tasks as well. So the, the place before I took over had a severe security because uh, what the former owner did not want is everybody from the road walking and, and, and cause certain upheaval or whatever. And, and the marina was in the middle of the town, the entry. I mean, when you went out of our area and went out on the street, there was this hustle and bustle and noise and cars and... I mean, amazing, and then you just walked in and walked in at it because we were further down by the water, and suddenly peace and quiet and calm, and like everybody who came walking in from the road was always like, whoa, this is a haven of peace, thank God. <laughs> So people really, look, when they went shopping in, in the week or so, they used to come in and, and sit down and just to cool off for a while, you know, they were happy to be, and, and they didn't have to walk far, it was right there. And I kind of loosened the protocol to come in the marina because, I mean, I said, I'm here in Jamaica, uh, how can I keep out Jamaicans? out of my marina it doesn't make sense you know i i wanted to everybody to know you are welcome to come of course you have to abide to our rules and our uh uh you have a certain attitude i mean you cannot just come in with your with your loud street noise and go in and go on and shout and cuss and uh, -uh. you come in here and you behave like everybody else and don't uh, uh, start any upheaval because I mean Jamaicans love to do that especially when they are under their white rum or you know when they want to play domino they can be exp extremely loud and noisy which I, is perfectly okay but not in this place so so what was was the former owner <coughs> protocol he didn't like yeah, he, Jamaica? first of all you had to the security would stop everybody by the gate and you basically had to sign in otherwise you couldn't come in and then of course a lot of jamaican people were really afraid to to follow that even the people that uh would have been extremely suitable to visit that place you know so I, I kind of loosen it to the degree, and not completely, you know, because I didn't want it to open up too much neither. Because remember, when you have a marina, you have boats stuck there, and and uh, it's vulnerable because if people just would come in and break in and, and, and go on the boats and, and steal from the boats or whatever, that would be <laughs> that would be disastrous for the business and for the boats as well. Mm -hmm. So of course we needed to to uh, have a certain control, but is a lot of people when when I met them in the town and said, look, why don't you come by one time and have a drink? Me, Marina, you mad? Me can't go in there. Them now go let me in. I said, no, 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 you can come now. I'm there now. So please make me know. Uh, even for the first time, let me know you're coming, and then no problem, you can come in. So that is how we got the place a little bit more popular um, around, um, among the locals. Uh, locals. And another problem we had been facing as well was that some of the sailors, you know sailors have a tendency to come to the same place, like they, like they make their rounds, mm -hmm. you know, and they might come back like every year or even every two years. And apparently the former owner had a very strict attitude with them and and they were not pleased at all so we had this radio that whenever whoever came could radio in from before because then we would have to alert the customs personnel and uh, immigration people because once you come from outside in a harbor you have to check in like in every airport in every uh and on every border so 
when people used started to radio in and, and said, oh yeah, we are coming in and we are going to anchor out and we'll get to start, uh, get to talk a bit. And, and then uh, they said, uh, some of them they asked directly, oh, is, is Vern still here? And then we said, no, it's a new owner and different running. Yeah, yeah, but still, uh, we, we are going to anchor out because we can't, we can't, uh, we don't want no trouble with the person over there and stuff like that. And we said, okay, well, come in. And then once you are in, you can still have a look. So it took about actually three years until our reputation kind of overrode the former reputation being that we are very friendly and very welcoming to all sailors. Whereas before it seemed like there had been some very, I don't know even what had happened exactly with all these people that didn't want to come in. But once they came in and, and they had to come on uh, to land with their dinghies anyhow because they needed to check in and, and uh, pick up the customs people and stuff. And then they looked around and they saw the atmosphere and they saw we, we got to meet them and we said hi and because the thing is when you anchor out we wouldn't earn anything. Boats that anchor out were free. Only when they came on dockage they would be charged per foot length and then uh, I would make a little money out of them. You know, because and then they could uh, get electricity, They ha every boat would have their own meter. They could uh, get water, of course, um, by meter as well. So that would be my income. Mm -hmm. So of course, for me, it was more interesting to have them on dockage than out in the harbor. But luckily, when they started to come in and saw how the atmosphere was and stuff, then most of them decided to come on dockage. Which you can imagine, some crazy sailors from all over the world coming in. now. Remember the place open seven o'clock in the morning and Believe you me from seven o'clock in the morning people would sit by the bar and start drink beer and Start chat and talk and tell stories about their sail trip here and see and, and worse if a new boat came in You know then of course oh fresh meat you know? <laughs> and Everybody would go and tell me your story and so it was extremely interesting to be there and every boat that left left us with a flag where they would write the name of the boat on it and sign it mm -hmm. and we would hang up all the flags so after a while the whole marina was plastered with flags mm -hmm. and believe me when the boat came back after a year or two years the first thing they did was look for their flag you know <laughs> is it still there and Oh, if it wasn't there, it was like sometimes I had to take off some because they were so mashed up and torn, torn up and I, I couldn't let I mean I let them hang until almost to nothing. the <laughs> nothing was left just because I knew oh my god if that's not there anymore they go kill me you know <laughs> so that was practically then our our daily life with all these people and and uh going on and getting used to my new job and getting used to this complete new runnings for, for me and uh, for the children as well. All oh, the children loved it. They were like practically in the water from morning to night. I mean they came from school and jumped straight in the water. We were swimming all over the place. Sometimes they got a little uh, <clears throat> um, dinghy or something and they could all go or go on further and paddle out and so so i didn't see my children until almost bedtime <laughs> because they they came from school and uh, homework was like hey guys before you do anything else you better do your homework you know because otherwise uh-uh so they had a wonderful life of course a lot of friends came over seeing that they could jump in the water there too now and stuff so Everybody was really, really happy about our new beginnings in the marina and more stories will follow soon. <laughs> That's it for today. <laughs> so guys, that is it for this story time. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in our next video. Yay! Bye! Bye!